taking a genius break is not just muscles and bones and how we breathe and how we're thinking mindfully. It's also trying to take a pause to get into that story. When we connect that light of joy, which is part of our spark, that light is an eternal flame that flows in our story, in our mind, in the way we breathe and operate, and yes, how we operate in the world. When we connect into the meaning of what matters, suddenly that is what pulls forward in the priority. The small stuff doesn't need to matter because at the end of the day, when we think about our lives and we look back, people really don't remember what we say or do. They remember how we feel when we're around them. Taking time for yourself, you're helping yourself to have a different consciousness for the rest of the day. And when we're in a place of well-being, the energy of the folks around us feel that too, whether or not we're talking about it. So it's not selfish. <laughs> it's actually the greatest gift you can give to everyone. And why not enjoy your own life story while you're living it? Hey there, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I have Larissa and Dr. Susie Carmack behind the scenes. Oh, I'm going to even cry just talking about Susie, but I met Susie. <laughs> I think it was 2019. And we met in Australia when we went on a retreat. And we've been friends ever since, instantly connected, just like soul sisters full hearts for each other. And I wanted to bring her in here because from the moment that I met her, she's just a shining light. I'll let Larissa share all of her professional things with you, but she is the sweetest, kindest, nicest human I've ever met. Heart of gold. And I'm excited to have her here. So with that being said, I will let Larissa take it away. But thank you so much, Susie, for being here and for sharing with our tribe. Thank you so much, Erica, for that sweet welcome. Today, we have Dr. Susie Carmack, who is globally recognized for her efforts to promote well-being in the workplace. As a number one best-selling author, well-being scholar, professional of yoga therapy, and intervention designer. She has trained, mentored, and certified thousands of coaches, leaders, and teams on five continents in her signature and evidence-informed methods for well-being optimization and lifestyle medicine. Dr. Carmack has been personally commissioned by hundreds of leaders, organizations, and government agencies to conceptualize, design, develop, deliver, and evaluate well-being promotion programs, including the Pan American World Health Organization, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Department of Education, and the U.S. Treasury Executive Institute. How amazing is she, guys? She is the author of multiple journal articles and the number one bestsellers being Ultimatum and Genius Breaks. We are so excited to have her join us here today to share her wellness expertise. Let's give a warm welcome to the amazing Dr. Susie Carmack. Whoa, thank you. What a double header of amazing introductions. I've been really blessed to get to do some talks in this lifetime. And I have to say that's more than likely the best intro I've ever had. So thank you. I've made a living and a life out of helping people to take a deep breath when times are great and when times are tough. When we're in success, we still have struggle. And when we have struggle, we still have success. And how do we keep centered no matter what? So I'm doing that now, FYI. These are tools that are dynamic and are ones that we try our best to apply in our lives. So thank you to Erica. Thank you for this entire community. And there's so much exciting things that y'all are doing with the rich and joyful space. And I love the aims of feeling like these things don't need to be exclusive, that we can be building prosperity in our lives, my word for rich and joyfulness, and that they don't have to be thought of separately, but how do they connect? So it's an honor to be here. Thank you for that. I've made a life, as I mentioned, and a living for many years. I'm now a grandma. I have bonus grandchildren. And I really started in this space as someone who grew up in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, PA, in a very modest way, really fascinated with the human condition. And my career has taken many twists and 
turns, but I really feel blessed to be bringing all of those pieces together and really wanting to make this relevant for you today. So we're going to learn kinesthetically because as you can probably tell from what's behind me, I am a nerd, I'm a professor, but I'm also a yoga teacher. So I love to teach and deliver with movement. So I invite you to come up to a standing place and I'm going to share with you the five doors we're going to give you for today to help you with what's called a genius break. So I want you to visualize a target board. So we're gonna draw it with our hands. Go ahead and join me, okay? So we have a circle, the outer circle, I want you to visualize as we just make this circle, that is your physical body. That's symbolic of your physical body. And in yoga philosophy, we call it the Anamaya Kosha. So that is your kind of muscles and bones and connected to the food we take in and even the food of the environment, what we expose ourselves to and also how we interact with it. So one of the strategies I'll teach you today is how we are in this space of choosing what we take in and choosing what we let go of which is sounds like a bumper sticker, but there's more to it than that, okay? So we have our physical sheath, right? Now we go inside of that. Imagine that you could draw another circle inside. That is the layer of the breath or prana and our life force and in the movies, let the force be with you, right? But our breath is symbolic of our life force energy and how we manage our breath can really change where our energy is and I'll be teaching a bit more about that in a moment. This is just the teaser here, okay? So let's go to the next circle in. It's like a tinier circle. So what do we have so far? We have the physical body, we have the breath, and then we have the mind. And boy, do we have busy minds as entrepreneurs. We are always thinking, we're looking for ways to create. We are co-creating things that haven't happened yet. And we're thinking about what we're thinking about, what we're thinking about all the time, right? So thinking about how we can be careful about the thoughts we allow to stay and the thoughts that we choose to let go of. And that's a yoga in its own right. Going inside of that really tiny, kind of underneath it, almost to the bullet point or that kind of zero bullseye, I should say. A little right around it is your story and your Vinyana Maya layer. So many folks in the course content space call us all geniuses at something. And this is where the concept of genius breaks comes from. But really that links to a very ancient yoga philosophy concept our Vijnana Maya layer, which is really our layer of our Dharma, our commitment, our inner calling in this lifetime. What our DNA and our calling all mix up together that makes us amazing and our weirdness and how that's wonderful and owning that genius and sometimes the part of it that we wish was a little different or we know is a lot different than others, but at the same time makes us uniquely special. And a lot of my research has actually been about how people find that story within them and how they live that out loud. To me, that's where well-being sits and lives is when we have congruence with that story that's deep within us and how we live it on the outside. So part of taking a genius break is not just muscles and bones and how we breathe and how we're thinking mindfully. It's also trying to take a pause to get into that story, which we'll be doing in a moment. And then there's that little dot inside and that's the heart space. And Erica gave me one of these earlier. I'll give that out to all of you. So this yoga philosophy framework that again, looks like a target board, the target on the inside, the deepest layer is actually joy bliss. So ancient yogis would say something along the lines of a song you may have heard as a kid. I know my mom used to sing to me, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Or I've got the joy down in my heart. The bliss layer, the tiniest little dot is the joy we have inside. And so the yoga philosophy teaches us that when we connect that light of joy, which is part of our spark, also part of a bigger light that's well beyond us, the kind of micro and macro together in consciousness. That light is an eternal flame that flows in our story, in our mind, in the way we breathe and operate, and yes, how we operate in the world. And when we think about burnout, which is some of the problem space we're solving today, imagine that little dot, you have that light, that consciousness and that bliss, 
And then that gets mixed up in your story and you know your dharma, you know what you're committed to, you know the love that you have, the true love you have for what you do, the love you have for supporting your clients, the love you have for making a difference. Well, imagine when those two mix together, almost like a flame that hasn't quite been tempered or controlled. <laughs> and suddenly there's no fire pit around that flame. And guess what it does? Suddenly it's burning through the layer of our mind and it's burning through the layer of our breath. And suddenly all of our life force energy, which our breath is symbolic of, is burning, it's being consumed. The fire is consuming our life force, our vitality, our energy, whatever words work best for you. That feeling of, we often say even our battery feels low today or our battery feels high today. We feel highly charged as high performers or we feel our battery is low. That's that kind of breath life force. So when we find ourselves in a place where we love what we do, and as part of our story, we feel called in this lifetime to be living it. It's so easy for that to burn through our mind, always thinking about work, burning through our life force energy. And yes, ignoring, guess what, our self-care and the body's needs as a human. Self-care can also be fun. It doesn't have to feel like have tos. They can be want tos. But that is essentially what I've just given you is some yoga philosophy, some yoga theory, actually, on when we think about true practices of yoga. Yes, sometimes it's beautiful postures that you may see on your newsfeed or go to a studio and practice with a great yoga teacher. And there's something great for our body and mind with all of that. So not to be in any way but supportive to that. And we know that the word yoga means union. It means coming actually into those two deepest layers, the union of those for self-liberation, the story and the joy in my words. So the whole concept of what I wanted to talk with you about today and give you some tools for is to own it, <laughs> that you're here because you love your work. You love the support you give to your clients. You feel, I would imagine, an inner calling or else you wouldn't care enough to be here, frankly, and you wouldn't be so committed to what you're doing. You're not doing this just for yourself. You're doing this to be of service. And anyone that feels called in this way to their work can easily burn out because we're with that joy fueling it and just feeling like we're wanting to give more and more to it. So the one strategy for burnout Jen, and even recovery is to actually think about how are we taking care of each of those layers. And so for today, I'm going to teach you some strategies from my book, Genius Breaks. What can we do in a few minutes as an entrepreneur, not trying to tell you that you need to slow down because guess what? We know that's probably not happening. I'm not trying to tell you that you're doing it wrong. I think it's easy when we think of self-care, the guilt meter goes up and we start thinking like, oh yeah, I should be doing this. Everyone has more they can be working on <laughs> and that's okay. But to really give you strategies to focus on for those five layers, and we're going to focus on that today. So the first strategy to focus on is the physical body. This body needs to move. So I'd like to invite you to do a little movement with me. So if you'd like to stand again, or if you would rather be seated, it's okay. We're going to make a W. Okay. So uh, you can see the W if you drew a line with my arms, right? Please only move the way that works for your body. Okay. So I have to say that because I can't see you. And I want you to take the arms here and just gently pull the shoulder blades together just a little bit. It's a little awkward because guess what? We're bringing our chest forward and we are not usually walking in a room like this. So it's socially awkward, but also really good for circulation and nervous system here. W. Then we'll take it to an O. Watch out for things around you. Almost like you're hugging a tree and really visualize those shoulder blades going away from the spine, quite the opposite. And then guess what? Back to W. So let's just take that biomechanic movement, basically moving the shoulder blades around, which help move the arms around. And I call these wow arms, because guess what? We're saying the word wow with our kind of YMCA kind of thing going on here, right? All right, so W, take a nice deep breath in with me. Now let's add some breath to it. Inhale here, shoulders are down, heart is open. Exhale as we bring it all together. We can even take the head down now, almost like you're turning into yourself. And then back to W, lifting up and out. And just try to sink the movement 
to that. You can go faster or slower, whatever feels better for you. Some of you might really be loving a nice deep inhale on a busy day. Some of you might love a really long, luxurious exhale. Sometimes in our kind of midday, we need to take a deep breath in a little longer to energize. At other times, we need to take a nice deep exhale to release. Okay, so what we just did is biomechanic movement that's been planned and <laughs> intentional in that in our day when we are so, think about it, what do we do physically? I'm going sideways so you can see my posture. What do we do when we really care about what the client's saying? We lean in. What do we do when we're at the computer, when we're really hyper-focused on writing that thing out? There we are again. What do we do when we're making dinner or whatever we're doing at the counter? Probably here, <laughs> okay? And so the body is all in, but at the same time, over time, that can not be great for posture. And it also actually compresses some of our key areas for circulation and our nervous system are here. Lymphatic system too. They're all throughout the body, but there's some key things going on here. And so in addition to that, from a muscle standpoint, the upper the muscles that are between the shoulder blades there are stretched over time. And it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we, we start to get tight up here, overstretched in the back. As we go in life, we want to try to counteract that and not have that turn into the posture that we have all the time. So taking time to do some wow arms as weird as they are, okay? If you feel weird, invite people to join you. It's a great way to start a new trend, right? So try the wow arms. Great for the body. When we added the breath to it, if you noticed, I was giving you some little cues. Long inhales, just like you smell a great flower, a great fragrance, are energizing. Long exhale, calming. So we put basically two strategies together. And I took longer to explain it than you really need. To do four or five of those in less than two minutes would already be healing and helpful. So that's what we might call mindful movement. There's many other ways to practice mindful movement, but we're being mindful about where the body is. And if you notice the act of focusing on what was or wasn't moving, letting go of shoulders, moving shoulder blades, that inherently helped us to pull our mind off of whatever else we were doing. So there's a double benefit here for stress management. We took a break literally from stopping what we were doing. We focused our attention and practiced the beauty and the art of single tasking. And we gave our body some movement that it could really use to counteract the, the day that we have in part of our modern lifestyles. So we're already getting all kinds of benefits for many of those layers and I'll review a little bit later, but we're missing one piece for a genius. We actually have a lot of research today on what are called micro breaks and they've been researched a long time yoga or not you know the, just the idea that we're taking a micro break or a mini break in the day and what are some of the health benefits of that so in my own research in the late 2010s and in the early it's coming into the mid 2015 time frame uh, when I got to partner with the World Health Organization to do a big campaign, we were fighting what we called then sedentarism. We call it sitting disease now. Those of us who've been thinking about how our modern lives have us sitting so much, the idea of needing to bake in regular times to pull over and actually get standing, get moving a bit, is something that can feel difficult. We're so engrossed in what we're doing, we love it so much, and if we don't take those time to pull away, then we're missing out and we're increasing the likelihood of that burnout happening that we mentioned. So by pulling away from what we're doing, taking time to think about the body, it needs to move. Now I gave you one movement today, your body knows what it needs, listen, and it will tell you. Don't let anyone else, including me, tell you what to be doing with your body, because it's yours. <laughs> but if you can move the body in a way that complements where else you've been not moving in the day, and add some breathing to it, highlighting inhales to wake up if you're feeling sluggish, which is understandable if you've been working too hard, 
or to exhale deeply to release stress and the residual accumulation of uh, tension in our mind and heart and body. If you're adding intentional breath and that kind of welcoming energy inhale or releasing energy exhale, you're actually starting to play with what yogis like me call the prana of the body, this life force, this may the force be with you stuff, okay? So there's one piece though that we're missing out on with the genius break that helps us to get not just from the physical layer or the breath layer, but to really get into the mind layer, the story layer, and the joy layer. I call them three M's and you can remember them right now. So we already did two. Movement, move as not just exercise, but moving as a complement to sitting too much as a way to pull yourself away from what you're doing and inherently prevent the, the burnout we talked about. Mindfulness, which can be breathing and can also be intention, which we're going to get to. And then the third M is meaning. And this idea of how can we connect into the meaning of our life? How can we also think about putting some meaning making in our day? There's so many names for it, but um, you might have heard of narrative medicine. You might have heard of something called sense making in PR, like how do we make sense of a trend? And you might have heard of reframing from maybe a counselor or a therapist. How can we reframe that? You might have heard of intention setting or even mantras to focus on for the mind. These are all different pieces of this same category that we'll call meaning making. And for me, and hopefully for you as a strategy that you can add to your toolbox is to take time for, we'll call it a genius break today, to move a little, to be mindful a little, and then to think about what meaning do I want to create out of this moment? So to give you a quick example, and then we'll get moving again. I am blessed that I'm a business owner. I'm also a department chair in a university. I also consult organizations with change efforts. And I've been blessed to help people to not only adopt new solutions from a technology standpoint, but also how do we help the people to be okay with that, which some call the change management space. But one thing that I noticed from all these different settings government agency, academic setting, you name it, is that everyone has moments where either the leader has to ask something that's hard of the team and or the team has a hard thing they've got to tell the leader. But let's be honest, there's hard stuff going on. Sometimes as a senior leader, you're actually working on things you're not ready to talk about yet because you want to put them in place or you want it to be a better kind of fully fleshed out idea, right? Or maybe you want to surprise in a good way. You want to surprise your people at the end of your bonus or something like that. So it doesn't always have to be sad change or difficult change. It can also be good change. But in all of that space where it gets difficult is that space of, wow, we have to do a hard thing. The end of the leader realizes they have to do a hard thing by asking for more or less, telling people stuff, you name it, telling a client, no, nope, we can't move the world for you, but we can do this thing instead. All day long, we're dealing with that kind of challenges. And then conversely, managing up or leading up a team member needing to disclose to a superior, hey, I can't do that thing you wanted and I've got to do something different instead. So in all that space, it's interesting to think about how can we reframe and connect within ourselves and get to this kind of centering or okay place to prepare us to have a difficult conversation? And this is transportable to home life too, but that's a whole other talk. Okay, so like tough talk, how do we handle it? Not before while we're in it, but actually how do we prepare ourselves for it? So this is where the reframe comes in as a hypothetical, I may have to tell my team that we've got to go left when we thought we were going right. And I know that this is going to be more work for them. Also surprising, which in its own right is stressful. And I just know it's going to be hard to hear. And when I come into that, I also can start to feel maybe tight in my chest and having other physical embodiments of, wow, I really don't want to do this to them. I don't want to cause them harm. I really care for them. And we're in a situation where this needs to happen. So how do I reconcile that? In the beginning, I will take a moment for myself and think about what is the meaning that I can create out of this moment? 
And in this case, maybe it's an opportunity for the team to pull together where I can come forward and say something along the lines of, we thought we were going left and now we have to go right. And how can we come together? I have some ideas of how we can do this together, but I want to bring you into the space with me so that we can think about how we can best go about it. And I'm going to be real with you that this isn't necessarily easy. And I know we have the capacity to do this together. So notice the difference between I'm going to tell you to do that <laughs> and keep it to myself. There's a little bit of transparency there. It stops short of complaining. Hey, I don't like this any more than you do. We're not going into that. We need to be role modeling some positivity here, but we can invite folks into problem solving. And generally speaking, when we come forward with a problem and we invite folks to come into problem solving with us, that can be the beginning of meaning making. Internally, I'm going to a place of maybe practicing, let's say gratitude. I'm grateful that I have a team that we'll be able to figure this problem out even if I can't see it right now. So what I would do with wow arms, and this is where I invite you to come back and join me, is we're gonna take the word, the W that we did, and we're gonna sprinkle in meaning. What I'd like to invite you to do is to think about what are you grateful for, let's say your clients, maybe you're grateful for the particular type of work you get to do with them, grateful for the team that you have that you're working with, or even grateful for your own capacity to evolve and to step up to hard things that actually help us to get stronger over time. So when we come into the phrase of the meaning making for this genius break, we're going to come into the theme of gratitude. And I'm doing that as an example today, but when you're creating your own genius break, you make up the movement, you make up the mindfulness, maybe the breathing, maybe something else to focus on, and you make up the meaning. So let's come into the space of gratitude, and I'd like to invite you to come into your heart space. And just think of that word, grateful, a few times through. Great on the inhale, full on the exhale. and start to visualize the humans or the moments that come with that space of gratitude for you. Almost like a movie of your mind where you're coming into the space of noticing, really seeing, perhaps it's a memory, reinforcing a moment that you've figured things out before, a proof of concept that we can do it again, or maybe it's a visualization, visualizing it going well when you take on that tough talk or that tough challenge. Grateful for the opportunity. It doesn't mean toxic positivity though, so let's be careful. Grateful we can try, grateful we can do this together. These are just some examples I'm giving you, but you have your own. That's your story in there. So with that sense of gratitude, almost like that's a piece of that light of joy that we talked about before. Now let's imagine that we are gently supporting that and expanding that. So we'll take a nice deep inhale as we come back into our wow arms, inhaling as we open up and really feel your heart center open to that possibility. Exhale as you wrap your arms around the intention seeing what you're grateful for in that space, inhaling to lead with the heart and to stay open, exhaling to come in. One more time, moving mindfully with meaning, three M's. Let's bring our hands to our heart center And let's seal this energy with something that you're grateful for about yourself today. I'm grateful that you're here with us, whether it's live or in the recording. Grateful that we have the opportunity to help other humans, however we're called to do so. Knowing that we're part of that light within and that we show up in our full story, the world gets better. When we get clear about our story, the thoughts that aren't so nice start to fade. The breath becomes a little easier and the body gets a little stronger because it doesn't have so many distractions. 
It's coming back to the meaning of what's important. Let's take a nice deep breath to finish. Thank you. The movement is helping the body. It's helping other things too. We know that movement helps the brain work better. Our Western minds want to line it up step by step, but it's a good messy. It helps us to remember for today, because I know y'all are busy. The physical body movement helps with that. Mindfulness, being mindful of your breath. Guess what? You're already winning. That's a mindfulness practice. We can live mindfully. And at the same time, being mindful of our breath, we're already practicing mindfulness. And then when we connect into the meaning of what matters, suddenly that is what pulls forward in the priority. And we're not fighting little mini fights with our mind about distractions that are perhaps getting in the way of our dharma and getting in the way of our showing up as fully as we can. So we can come back to the deep meaning of our why, as Simon Sinek would say, then cut through the clutter of the mind we in yoga don't think of the mind stuff as we call it as something that we should feel bad about having i know many folks today are challenged by anxiety or depression there's not something wrong with us if those challenges don't occur let me be clear if that's a challenge you have this is not going to be a complete antidote for it but by focusing on meaning, we can take a break from those thoughts that are perhaps overwhelming. And we can do these practices in addition to whatever medical care that you're under for these things. So I wanna be careful that we're sharing the benefits, but it's not a panacea. <laughs> it's not a full solution, it's a companion. Movement for the body, mindfulness for our vitality and our breath and our overall energy system. Longer inhales wake us up, longer exhales calm us down. And connecting into meaning, connecting to what's true for us helps us to reframe the day and to realize that this small stuff doesn't need to matter. Because at the end of the day, when we think about our lives and we look back, this is, I believe, a paraphrase of a great quote by Maya Angelou. People really don't remember what we say or do. They remember how we feel when we're around them. And so when we come back to that sense of meaning and we come into that space of transparency with our team and come into the space of working things out together. And that's where we're co-creating. We're really tapping into that overall sense of consciousness. I will leave you with a quote I do know by heart by Albert Einstein, which was, no problem was ever solved with the same consciousness that created it. And so taking time for yourself, whether or not you call it a genius break, to do any of the M's, maybe all three together, you're helping yourself to have a different consciousness for the rest of the day. And as you make those shifts inside, that's a ripple effect that people will be benefiting from as well. The science of stress contagion teaches us that when we're burned out, it shifts the energy of the people around us. And when we're in a place of well-being, the energy of the folks around us feel that too, whether or not we're talking about it. There's actually a lot of research on this phenomena of well-being contagion and stress contagion, respectively. So it's not selfish. <laughs> it's actually the greatest gift you can give to everyone. And why not enjoy your own life story while you're living it? Thank you for the chance to share these tools with you today. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Carmack. I feel like this is such a mind blowing session and I didn't realize how tense my body was when I did that wow exercise. So guys, if you have any questions for Dr. Carmack, please put them in the comments. Or even if you guys can put in what you've learned from this masterclass, because as Erica mentioned in her previous masterclass, sometimes the comments are even more important than questions. You get a lot of reflection from it. So we actually have a question from Paula. She's asking, how often do you recommend we do these breaks? What a great question. Hey there to you, Paula. Nice to see you and happy to, to share. So it's interesting that depending on which source you read, taking a break for as little as two minutes can shift our energy, can even shift some of our chemistry. But so the good news is they don't have to be long. So if I jump into physical activity literature, they would say that from a mood perspective, our mood improves in the day with at least 10 minutes of movement. Okay. Now what's gets interesting is that we've maybe learned in class in school or even out and about that 20 minutes of exercise starting to challenge the cardiorespiratory system aerobically, for example, is going to start to help our heart to stay healthy. And then there's different plateaus depending on whether or not you're an athlete, you're hitting these different thresholds for your heart, either preventing the system from not working as well as it could versus getting it stronger and stronger. Right? When we think of movement as a tool to help our mood, and our creativity, as little as 10 minutes can really make a difference in our mood improvement. What's interesting is that more movement throughout the day doesn't seem to move 
the mood meter, can't say that fast, as really much after the 10 minutes. From a cardiovascular standpoint, more movement is going to get you more and more heart health. I would say that at least 10 minutes would be a great place to begin. And you don't have to do them all at the same time. It could be two minutes in the morning, two minutes mid-afternoon. Maybe your morning breaks are more energizing, getting you going. Your afternoon breaks are more calming. Maybe a break transition, especially if we're working from home. That's me here, right? We need a moment. We're not driving from one place to another we need a moment to clear ourselves as we take on the different hat of whoever we are after we work so they can be used as a transition in the day you start with maybe a couple of just two minutes and see how that goes for you and working up to 10 minutes so now i've learned to try to aim for two minutes if you can for each bout each execution and then try to weave together 10 if you can I hope that's helpful Thank you so much. Just a little bit of movement and actually breaking up those times would be helpful because like for me, I work from home and I tend to forget to even move. Like I feel like I'm glued to my seat most of the time. And I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs do that as well. So even just a stretch or taking a little break, maybe when you have your lunch break, going out and just taking a little walk would be great. And doing those wow exercises really helps. It's not selfish to take care for yourself because you're actually giving more to your clients by being able to take care of yourself. You're able to put more effort and more care into the service that you give to your clients. We know that burnout is a common issue among entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on some signs of burnout that we could watch out for and how we can recognize when it's time to make changes. Really great question. I'm really glad to be going into that problem space, even though it's hard to talk about. So it's interesting in the stress space, we know that talking about stress, saying the word stress is stressful. <laughs> I think that in the everyday multiverse, we use the word burnout, but it's almost like this bucket term that nerds like me study it. There's different ways that it shows up, different names we give those, and they're coming from different source problems. So I'm going to do my best to give you just some highlights here. And this is what we would say, not comprehensive or representative. <laughs> it's just like the top ones I see. So total bias going on for science nerds, bias alert coming. So burnout as its own thing, like really the getting to the pure essence of the science of it, it really shows up with three things. Cynicism, we get a little jaded, we get a little skeptical, we get a little snarky. <laughs> We get like teenager syndrome. Oh, really? Like eye rolling syndrome. Depersonalization, which is a fancy way of saying, I don't know if I can do this anymore. You're really having this existential moment. Do I really want to be doing this? It's some pretty big questions. No wonder because it's connected to that deep layer it would be the theoretical model. I would link that to others might say it differently. And the third is exhaustion. Oh, you're burned out. You're exhausted. You're tired. And we swirl those together. But there's the tired version and the wired version of that exhaustion. The exhaustion where the body's tired, but the mind is continuing to race and in all of that. So that's the purest essence of burnout. What gets fascinating about burnout though, is that the individual thinks it's their problem, but it's a systems issue. So in an organization, for example, the people who care the most, who try to advance the most, the people who are going for the A plus, those folks, okay, they're the most likely to burn out. And if they're in a place, it's almost like a car where you're in mud and you're pressing on the gas and you're trying to go and you're not going anywhere. So what do you do? You keep pushing on the gas, but the wheels just keep spinning. And at some point the engine can't handle it. And so much like that metaphor, what you might think of is taking a block of wood, getting some help, leveraging it under the tire and then moving forward. And so we need support. We need help in my work, the three S's. So Genius Breaks is three M's and being ultimatum is three S's to make it super simple. But we need three things. We need self-care, taking care of those layers I talked about. We need connection. We need places where we can come and say, you know what, I am having a day. Because that's going to ease some of the tension off that cynicism and not let that build up over time. And we need support. We need services. We need people who are pros that can help us and really help us prevent the problem or manage it and recover from it. And many of us are in burnout recovery, much like other recovery programs, not to make light or be dismissive of them, but actually to honor that it is an ongoing commitment to not only manage our burnout if we have it, but to also prevent it from fostering earlier. I say this as someone who researches it and someone who's actually had it. I won't go into all the other types of burnout, but the one I will say that I think is perhaps also 
felt a little differently is something called compassion fatigue. And that actually comes from caring too much. If you imagine the image of someone who loves someone at a hospital and sitting by their bedside and wanting to focus on the person they care for and never wanting to leave. And the nurse says, hey, you got to go home and get something to eat. You got to go take a shower. But the person loves that person so much they don't want to leave. And out of that love can be the exhaustion. And so it feels the same way on the outside from that exhaustion, but it's coming from a different place. It also can come from taking on the stress of others over time. So folks in the helping professions like counselors and therapists are trained that they need therapists, <laughs> that they need a place that they can go to take what they're getting emotionally. And we get that from our clients and our team members. We support them with hard things and that can accumulate that receiving holding space for them, being strong for everybody. Over time, we need to figure out a way that that doesn't stick to us. It's not that we want to be insensitive and never listen, and quite the opposite. We need to have a place where we can transform that and release that. And for compassion fatigue, the solution is not so much getting social support and services as it might be for burnout. It's also about getting services to help, but also taking time to recognize the emotional weight of what we're being asked to do. And that's where the reframing of the genius breaks comes in, right? Because it helps us to shift the meaning of what we have going on in a less reactive way, in a more proactive way. It all comes back to that feel of being tired and feeling like we're not sure if we can do this. That's fair. And we all have life changes. So it's hard to know which one we're going with there. But I think that if we can try coming back to protecting those layers and thinking of them as a way that we would temper the fire and control it, the great thing is that light will go. It's like the Olympic flame. It will go and we will get to do so many things with it if we can make sure we've got the torch taken care of. So thanks for letting me share that. Yeah. And I'm so happy that you brought up the compassion fatigue because I know that really relates to a lot of service-based entrepreneurs because you take all of your time, especially in the beginning of the business as well. If you're by yourself or you don't have a team, your entire time is just taking care of your clients. And we see that a lot of entrepreneurs often prioritize their clients and their work over their well-being. And I feel that sometimes may even experience guilt or hesitation to take breaks because they feel very dedicated. So based off of that, can you share some strategies for how you can manage these feelings while also prioritizing your needs without feeling like you're neglecting your clients? Mm. I think that's so important. And I think when we have our own business, there's so much wrapped up in caring for clients, right? We care about them as humans. We care about the work we're doing. We want to do a great job. It's our name on it. If it's our business, right? Even if we're not even part of a bigger business, it's us. And we also care about them and our right livelihood is often mixed up in that. So it's hard to know how we can really reconcile all the feels <laughs> that come up with it. I think when we think about that against burnout or compassion fatigue, if you think about your body, it's almost like from the car analogy on the burnout side, we talked about feeling the spin in the mud. Compassion fatigue is almost like we forgot to fill up the gas tank. <laughs> You still got the same problem. You're not going anywhere. You're stuck in mud and you're pressing on the gas and you need some external help in organizations. There needs to be systems level change to support the person. And also leaders need to actually tell those who were a little too hard driving, a little trying too hard, like we got you. You don't have to try so hard. It's a marathon, not a sprint, that kind of language. So when we think about helping someone else with prevention, that can happen. But with compassion fatigue, I don't want to oversimplify it, but a lot of it I think is wrapped up in, did you pull over to get some gas and did you clear out the car? Like when you're on that big road trip, get rid of the trash, let's get rid of the toxins, whatever that is for someone. Maybe it's going for a walk and, and sweating it out. Maybe it's going to a massage therapist, a Reiki healer, you name it. They don't have to be expensive tools, but I think part of it is releasing and letting some of that residue of what we take on, letting our body get some clearing. And also what are we then restoring our well with? I think that's where it gets really tricky because if we love what we do, we get all this creative energy around it, but watch my hands. What am I doing? It's outflow. And what I think we need, the gas tank is inflow. So what is flowing into you, whether it's having a friend be there for you or doing something that's helpful. That's why I think this community is so great. It's a place where everyone can come and receive what y'all are putting together to give to people to pour into them. 
your team needs them pouring into you too. <laughs> Think about how can I complement all the outflow of what I'm being asked to do with what feels restorative and filling up that gas tank. I feel like if we can think about self-care that way, I like to call it self-leadership. I think it's really about remembering that we're asked to show up and shine and that light needs to be maintained and supported. I love that. Self-care, I find in business, a lot of people may not practice it because they're so immersed in business. And it's often overlooked, but it's such a key point to actually sustaining your business and helping you love your business. Because if you feel burned out by your business all the time, you feel like I'm never getting any sleep. I'm never spending time with my friends, with my family. You are not going to fully be able to put the love and your why into the services that you originally started the business for. So I love that you also changed the wording to self-leadership because that's something that I didn't even think about. So this is amazing. I have another question, and I think you touched a little bit on it, which is setting boundaries. With self-care, I think that setting boundaries is a huge part of it because it's not just setting boundaries with your clients, but setting boundaries with yourself. What are some strategies to help remind yourself of those boundaries and taking care of yourself? That's uh, such a great question. I'm so glad you're asking it. And I think even being open to this conversation is already a win. I think it's easy to get caught up in that flow and we're in a flow state and we do forget all the things. When we love what we do, when, we love, when we're geniusing, we forget we're human. <laughs> like this human needs to eat, this human needs to sleep, this human needs some time that's not work. So actually the strategy that comes top of mind that I wanna share with you was actually shared with me from a dear friend. He was a four-star general. <laughs> <laughs> and he's now retired and he was a one star when I was working with him, but we've kept in touch and we've had some really cool conversations about how he took that climb. And I've actually had the honor of supporting his team at one point. So imagine walking into a room of two and three and four star generals, right? No pressure for the yoga teacher. Yes, we have stress too. So all that to say, he shared something with me that even though he's Air Force, it was actually an army thing, but it's really simple. I think about it every day and I invite you to think about it too and see if it works for you. It's real simple numbers, two, 10, five, and seven. So I told you who it was from because let's be honest, I don't know of anyone arguably amongst the most busy, high performing, talk about stress people than a senior military officer who has 150,000 people working for him. And if he can do this, then we can do this <laughs> is what I think of. Okay. So here it is. Two, 10, five, seven, two hours a day. That's for you. And that could be for any of those layers. And I didn't really get into the spiritual component, but for those who have a strong spiritual belief, the story layer, Vinyana Maya, and the deepest layer, Ananda Maya, time for faith, time for devotion, whatever that is for you. Because for those of us who do have that life story of Dharma, as we call it in yoga, that inner calling is like calling from up above, whatever that is. So two hours to think about those layers. Maybe there's a workout in there. Maybe there's some devotional reading, some centering, dancing, silly, like it, it doesn't have to be so serious. Okay. But two hours, it's for you and you. It's almost like a meeting with yourself. Doesn't have to be all at the same time. Could be a little sprinkles in the day, right? Your genius break would count in there, by the way. Okay. Now this one, I have mixed thoughts about sharing, but I think it's pretty practical. No more than 10 hours of work a day. Now we're already in trouble because those of us who have studied behavior science and performance would say, when we hit the six hour threshold, we actually go down in terms of our productivity and mistakes are more increased. It's interesting to think about that in terms of how many people we know that have shifts that go 14 hours, whether or not they want them to. But we know that when we hit past 10 hours, we're really starting to ask really not great things for this human performance system. I'll just simplify it that way. Seven is sleep. Okay. And so not everybody needs seven. Some people say, oh, I can do four. And we also have this like weird badge of honor. Oh, look at me. I did an all nighter. I'm going to say with love, please don't do that to yourself. Have I done them? Yes. Do I want to never do them again? Absolutely. And the more we study the science of sleep, the more we realize that we're actually getting in the way of our creativity and our ability to think clearly when we don't sleep. So if you're trying to create something, Think of sleep as actually the first phase of writing it or creating it. 
the night before or the week before. The more that the body has sleep, the more that the mind gets rid of its gook that gets in the way of creativity. Super oversimplifying. <laughs> Anyone that's a sleep expert, please put in the science part that's much better than I just did. So two for you, no more than 10 for work, less please. And I think we're here because we want a life that isn't 10 hours a day of working. But I like to think of that in terms of productivity. As someone who is both a professor and a business owner, I'm pinging, I'm blessed to have work that I can really go after and pull back on and go into based on what's happening at the time. Being a business owner supports the ability for me to mentor my students because my business is the practice of yoga therapy and also bringing those tools to companies. And I train future yoga therapists, <laughs> so it's very synergetic. But at the same time, no more than 10 hours of productivity, less if we can get it and if that's the life we want. And then seven for sleep. And five, I like to think of as food, fun, and family. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Friends too. Let's add that as, as well. Maybe we have a family, maybe we don't. Maybe fun for us is being with a good book and not talking to a human. <laughs> Others are, let me go out and talk and, and connect and go to the local book club or whatever. That's where you get to have fun with it. Something that's not work related, something that lights you up. And I think something that gets our brain off of the thing that we're focusing on for the productivity. When we start to work on something, we give our brain something else to do. We actually come back with more creativity, more possibilities. Movement also increases creativity as much as 60%. So those genius breaks we talked about before, we didn't get into the creativity benefits, but taking time to move is actually building up your creative battery. So there you have it, two, 10, five, and seven. And if you can think about trying to block your time, my encouragement would be just you start a, a nutrition program, maybe by a few weeks of simply monitoring, not changing anything, but just monitoring how you're spending your time. I would start with that and then aim to one of those. If you're only giving yourself five minutes, start creeping up towards an hour and then two hours for the two hour time. If you're only getting five hours of sleep, start adding a half an hour or give yourself some rest in the day. You get the idea. Don't try to change all of it at the same time. Just go after one thing and uh, be okay with it being a practice, not a perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Carmen. We actually have a comment. Suli says, love this. Erica says, I love this. <laughs> Everyone is loving. You definitely have to have a lot of entrepreneurs in our community. And I have a few more questions if you have some time. Yeah, okay. let's go for it. This is great. Perfect. So we know that the entrepreneurship journey is a lonely one, especially with the demanding schedules, or maybe people might not have a great support system. And so some people might feel isolated because of this. In your expertise, how can entrepreneurs build a network of support and resources to help them on their well-being journey? That's so key. I think spaces like this, and I'm not just saying this because I love Erica, but I think because it's such an independent effort with an that entrepreneurial journey, especially in the new beginning, when you're literally like, you could have 20 hats above your head. I'm doing the website. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And you're like wearing them all at the same time or even not. Like when we get to the point where a business leader, we might have more people working for us. We're in the leader hat, but we also need the performance, almost like an actor in a role. Not that it's not authentic. So let me be careful here, but you need a minute where you take the hat off and be you. And you know, I take off my CEO hat with that team or I take off my department chair. I need a moment to be real. And I feel like I can be real with my teams, but I need that time. And so I think some of it is connecting with other people that are in a similar space, like y'all are doing here with entrepreneuring or some folks that are in a similar job focus area. So maybe you love doing website design for people and you're connecting with designers, maybe not just websites, but designers more in the broad sense, but people who not only get the subject matter expertise that you're bringing, but also get what it's like to have that day. No one gets a physician's life better than another physician, <laughs> maybe their spouses too, but I think you get my point. And not to say we can't be friends with other people, but I think some of that is healthy in that so much of our work is independent and it's easy to start to go into this spiral of, wow, this is so hard. I don't know if I can do this. This is tough to be slaying dragons every day by myself and to pull up every now and then and look around and go, oh, wow, everybody else is doing that in their own way and to be learning from each other and to be able to share those backstage moments is I think critical. And my research in um, 2014 for my dissertation showed that social support, which is basically being able to share what's going on, struggles and success. So it's not just about struggle. Look at me, I did this thing. I can't wait to tell someone like that. 
as much as, wow, this thing is really hard and I'm not sure where to go with it, witnessing others and being witnessed improved well-being. Like the numbers were so good, I had to run them again and they were predictive of well-being, not just correlated. So we need that. Now, in addition to the workspace, I think finding other communities we can connect with, I think we're all struggling even since the pandemic to start to decide where we want to put ourselves, be it online or geographically speaking, and how we want to start to establish connections again. And I think it would be silly to think that's easy right now. I do think that relationships is one of the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. In addition to nutrition and exercise and sleep and all that stuff we're supposed to do, trying to build relationships. And we do know that as we get older and hello in my fifties here, it's not about the volume. It's about the quality. I don't think it's about a contest of trying to just have more and feeling like that's one more thing we have to do. It's more about how can I find places where I can find deep and meaningful connection. And the difference of that with a client in a client relationship, it's outflow to the client. And they're in all in receiving flow. And there's a beauty in that. And the social support I'm talking about, we're not keeping score, but generally speaking, there's a flow back and forth of a giving and a receiving and a sense of not feeling alone. Because I do think that loneliness and isolation not only make us not think as clearly as we could from a business standpoint, if that's the thing we're worrying about right now, which should be fair, it really can start to be hard on our body and can really start to take us into some harder spaces for mental health as well. So I'll just park it there that finding what works for you, finding connection both within the workspace and with peers that get it, and finding connection outside of that, either online or with in your geographic region, don't be afraid to go after that. Because I think it doesn't have to be a community, but we do need to feel like we can come somewhere and share. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Dr. Carmack. Your upcoming book is coming out in 2024. Could you give us a little sneak peek or share what inspired you to write the book and how it complements your previous work? Oh, isn't that so kind of you? Um, thank you. It's Yoga for One. Big title is Yoga for One, How to Co-Create an Inclusive and Evidence-Informed Practice on and Off the Mat, which is a long title. It is admittedly geared to folks that are yoga teachers or yoga therapists or even yoga personal trainers, which is actually a new trend, and figuring out how we can support our clients with a practice that works for them on the mat and off the mat. I use that metaphor as far as how we live our yoga yoga and whether or not you call it yoga <laughs> the word yoga is implied by the connection of the word union and really connecting the story and the bliss the book is really going to be sharing how i feel it's important to co-create this practice in this lifetime for people on the mat and that's strategies for being safe i'm a safety nerd as much as it is about looking at movement and how it can be gesture like we did today so how to really create a practice with someone and how do we come about that in a way that is inclusive and loving of all bodies, all genders and identities, all ages. As someone who struggled with perfectionism in my early life at work and at home, yoga was the thing that helped me realize that I don't have to perform to get to happiness, but that joy can be in me even as I show up as fully as I can in this lifetime. I'm in a place now as I look at the legacy I want to be leaving to show folks a system for doing that, not a cookie cutter. It's more of a process and giving a place to begin. It's interesting to think about that's how we work with clients in the best way is we co-create with them. We share power with them. And the book will have some stuff about shared decision-making as well as not just the research of what is or isn't in best interest, but also the narratives of our clients and helping them to be careful of how they're telling themselves their life story. And that continues to be a theme for me. Yes. Thanks for letting me share. I appreciate the chance. Oh, yes. I saw Sophia here saying, thank you so much, Dr. Carmack. This was great to listen to. I completely agree. Thank you so much for being on here today. We appreciate you. and. We know that the teachings that you brought to the class today is going to immensely help so many entrepreneurs truly live their dream life. I appreciate that. And I appreciate all of you. And I'll end with this is that those wow arms are as much the metaphor to remember what to do as they are, that life will bring you wows.
It will bring you the wow of, wow, I can't believe that happened. (laughs) And it will bring you, wow, I can't believe this is happening. And the wows that we welcome and the wows that we don't, otherwise known as stress. And so I just encourage you to hang on with the wows and to have fun with deciding where you want to take your story next. And know that as you do that, you're giving other people the confidence to do that too. Thank you so much, Dr. Carmen. We'll see you again soon. Awesome. Shout out to everybody there. And thanks again to Erica. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much, Larissa. Great interview. I appreciate it.